well, hope you had a good lunch outside. Today I'm going to talk about gross network value. And this is something that's more scientific. This is a little bit more about showing you how we do very specific kind of research and what kind of research it looks, what kind of research you can expect in the Web3 crypto community moving forward. The main thing I want to talk about today is how do we calculate the value of crypto ecosystems. Today, everyone's thinking about GDP, uh, no, TBL, FDB, market cap, and I want to challenge that assumption in this presentation today. So, the agenda for today. We're going to understand the current state of value of value calculation, understand how do we measure the value of ecosystems, why it matters, I want to introduce this new term called gross network value, and what's next. Before that, I'll just introduce a little bit more about myself. Hi, I'm Lisa, and I'm from the company Economic Design. And Economic Design, we basically help protocols and help projects to build ecosystems, to build the economics of ecosystems. It's not just supply side of the problem, which is your vesting schedule, your total circulating supply, but also the demand side of why should why should people come to your ecosystem? What is your business model? What is your revenue stream? How do we integrate all of that into the tokens? I also wrote the book, The Economics and Math of Token Engineering and DeFi, and this is the second edition. So at the end of the, the chat, whoever that asks the best question will get this book. This book is retailing for 150 US dollars on Amazon. All right, so let's get started. Now, you guys heard a lot about how do we do value calculation. You have your market cap, your TVL, and FTV. And they are not bad calculations. These are just calculations for how we understand how to calculate the value of these ecosystems. They are good and bad. So I want to go through what they mean to you, what they mean for all of us in the ecosystem, and what kind of challenges they bring about by just sticking to these metrics. So the first one is market cap. Go to CoinMarketCap, you go to CoinGecko, you go to DeFi Lama and understand what is the, the market cap of the, of the assets, right? Typically we use that to, to measure the total value of company shares. So you look at Tesla, how much is Tesla trading for, and for each share, and how many shares they have in total. And so this is really good at understanding the market's perception of the company's value. The market, if you can drive a Tesla car, you can use Apple products, and then from there you can have a general market-based understanding of how much that value is probably going to be of the company by buying and selling the stocks. So this is a great understanding to, to get some market reply, market market response to the perception of the company's value. The problem with what it lacks is that it doesn't measure the value, the, it, doesn't, it only measures the value external from the protocol. How efficient Apple runs, the, how well the things are being designed. They don't have all these other internal intrinsic value added into the calculation of market cap. You can argue some, sometimes there's some sentiment analysis in there, but market cap in general, it just talks about the market perception of the company's value. So a, a way to, to put that into the context of Web3, if you look at how much Bitcoin is and you calculate the total circulating supply of Bitcoin, that is the, the value of Bitcoin. And that's the market cap, that's how we calculate market cap. So can you imagine if we take this from the example of the US, the US market, and we have the total US dollars, we calculate one US dollar times the total circulating supply of US dollars, then the economy will be trillions in surplus, not trillions in debt. So that's not the right way to calculate an ecosystem, an ecosystem that's buyers and sellers in, in the space. So that is market cap, is what we use today. The second thing is total value locked. So total value locked is calculating the value of assets within the ecosystem. And this is good to measure the total value of assets accrued to this ecosystem. And the problem is it does not measure the transactions within the ecosystem. So this is useful, for example, DeFi protocol. Right? If you want to talk about debtors and lending, you need to understand the liquidity and debt of these protocols to do more efficient trades. You reduce slippage costs, you have better interest rates, you have better transaction, transaction rates. But this is not relevant for a game. This is not relevant for an enterprise. This is not very relevant for loyalty points. And total value lock is unique to a very specific segment of DeFi protocols, but it's not relevant to all kinds of ecosystems out there. So it helps us to understand the total value locked in the system to give us insights to do whatever trade we need to do, but it doesn't measure the value of transactions within the system. The third thing that we have out there is FDB, fully diluted value. And this is, this is where we have the total price of whatever price of the tokens right now, multiplied by the total circulating supply that will be in the space to get an understanding of the total value related to the protocol. 
This is relevant for an investor, right? Let's say an investor wants to invest in something and then they, they can understand, okay, this is the price that I'm paying for, the total value given fully diluted market cap, that's, that's going to be the, the relevant price. And is that reasonable? Is um, it's, uh, the graph protocol or is one of these lending protocols going to be relevant? Is that valuation going to be relevant compared to what are, they, what are the other protocols out there? So it helps investors to get a sense check a common sense check to understand if am I overpaying for this asset. So that is really good to, for investors to understand FDB. But again, when we go back to economics, this is not enough to measure economic activities. It only shows what is the again, market perception or the general valuation of this company, but it doesn't give us insights to how much economic activity can be generated and then it's accrued to the users. So, I want to introduce GDP, gross domestic product, and what we want to do, what I want to challenge you is to look at these ecosystems, whether you're L1, L2, you're a game, you're a metaverse, you're, you're a big ecosystem, look at them as communities, as economies, as a country. The way to measure country is not total circulating supply of your dollars, or your lira, your GDP, or your, your GDP but understanding the, the value generated in this economy. And that's how we get GDP, gross domestic product. So gross domestic product is calculated, GDP over there, is calculated with five components. You have consumption, so how much people are consuming in your ecosystem, the transactions they have with each other, transactions with smart contracts, investment, when people are not just spending in current period, but they think that this ecosystem is going to grow. There's long-term value by staying in this ecosystem, I'm going to invest in this ecosystem. There's government spending, so that's where the Developers come in, build new products, sell new products, continue to increase the value created by the protocol. And then you import and export because of interoperability. So look at protocols like a country. You have all these five components in a country, you have all these five components in a protocol. And the way we need to calculate, we need to start thinking about value of an ecosystem, not just by the token prices itself, but what is the value generated by this ecosystem? Just like how much value is generated by a country. And I'm going to ch challenge that, and instead of just GDP, I'm going to introduce a new term called GNV, Gross Network Value. Because in the digital world, we don't have any specific domestic production per se, but we are a network, a network that produces value, intrinsic value, to whoever that's in the system. You could be a trader, you could be a gamer, you could be um, a debt, you could be an LP, but by being in this ecosystem, you receive intrinsic value because of how people trade, how people transact in the system. So, the important thing of why, why does this even matter? We've got market cap, FDV, TVL. They are useful enough. They're not perfect, but they're useful enough. Why does that matter? In economics, it's very important to measure things properly because when you know how to measure things properly, you know how to improve them, you know how to change them. DeFi and DeScience, just crypto in general, we're here to build a tool that helps better humanity. If we're using the wrong metrics, if we're using the wrong ways, KPIs or whatever numbers, and we're measuring the wrong things, we're going to improve all the wrong numbers. We're going to, we're going to improve the protocol to, to increase TVL, and then you just have a lot of leverage, a lot of people don't understand how to play leverage, and then they crash and burn. So it's important to create the right metric that goes back to first principles so that we can keep improving and changing the protocols that we, anyone is building for the betterment of humanity. And that's why this is so important. Because GDP is not just, oh, it's GDP, let's just build a leaderboard and see who has better GDP. GDP is about calculating the intrinsic value given to the users, given to all the economic agents in the space. And if we're building a protocol that helps to increase value to the users in the space, we're building the right protocol. We're going the right path of what crypto is supposed to do. If we're building protocols just to increase TVL or just to increase investors' pockets or just to in increase the whales, then that's not the kind of ecosystems that we want to build. We want to build something that's a little bit more fair. The truth is, even in, in science, even speaking to scientists, there's no such thing as fairness. But there's improvement. We can keep making protocols better. And so T GNV is one of these metrics that we're creating to help measure how the systems will work. All right, and just to summarize, new technology allows for the emergence of new market economies and the value generated that is created beyond monetary terms. You see there are a lot of things in crypto people say, not just because of monetary terms, but there are a lot of other intrinsic value, other principles, other philosoph philosophies that people come into the system. 
How will you imagine the future is that each of these crypto, each of these communities, each of these markets and economies are where people can freely come in and go, come and go, just like interoperability. They're not born into the system. You're not born into Turkey and you're just stuck in Turkey. You can move and be in any ecosystem. Then the market gets to decide. The market calculates GDP and gets to decide what ecosystem can really thrive. Then we're not limited to say that this is the best economic system or this is the best model that we can build. But different models are built and suitable for different kinds of economies. We build different economies. People get to choose what economy, or economies they want to build. And then from there, the market decides which economy actually makes sense, which economy adds value to the users. So I think this is very interesting. And that's why the calculating GNB is not just about, oh, as an investor or as, as a user, as a community, I have to think about all this stuff and, and I want to token prices go up, value goes up. But it's about building something sustainable, build, going back to first principles as a metric to build a better future. All right, so let's go back to topic and let's look at what is GNB, gross network value. So gross network value takes the concept of GDP. So GDP, again, is about calculating the value generated in a country. Again, because we don't have any domestic product, we have network effects, network value. Crypto is all about network effects. So how do we measure these two things together? How do we merge these two things together? So the first part is we have GDP. So GDP is our baseline. GDP, it represents the value generated by the ecosystem. And in GNB, here we have the intrinsic value. The intrinsic value is very specifically coming from economics. It's about the substitution effect. There's so many games out there. There's so many lending protocols. There's so many indexes. Why do you want to stay in this protocol? Why do you want to stay in this ecosystem? Because there's an intrinsic value for you to stay. The way to calculate it is the opportunity effect, opportunity cost. I could either trade in Curve or Balancer or Uniswap or Sushi, perhaps. And I want to stay in Uniswap. There's a reason for me to stay in Uniswap because there's, a, there's an opportunity cost that I have to pay to get my, my liquidity out of Uniswap and go to another ecosystem. So this, this opportunity cost, this substitu substitution effect, is what we want to calculate. And we add that as a multiplier effect or we add that as a, as a different component to GDP. So when we look at GNB, we look at how much value is being created in this ecosystem and the substitution effect of them staying in this ecosystem and not leaving. So this is how we calculate GNB, gross network value. And this is where we have the, the core component, core fundamental principles of why the ecosystem exists, the GDP part, and also the substitution effect and the network effect part, which is the intrinsic value. So quick summary again, why we use GDP. I don't want to assume that everyone took economics in school. In general, GDP is a way to calculate how much value is being generated. And virtual economies are quite similar to real economies. When we talk about economies, when we talk about platform, you realize that in the last 20 years, a lot of market and a lot of businesses have shifted away from, from just sellers being like just selling stuff to owning a network, an ecosystem. Hotels.com don't own any hotels. Uber don't own any, doesn't own any taxi. It's all about creating a platform, an ecosystem where buyers and sellers come in together to trade. And another place that we see that are countries. Countries are where people come together, they trade, they do business, they do things together, they create value together. And so we want to take this concept and apply it in the crypto space today. And GDP measures real economics, real economics. So we want to, from there, once we have GDP in place, we can measure other things like economy performance, the market value of all the assets created, and also from there we can create our GNB. So, as I told you, there are five components, the import, export, we get them together and call them net export. So there are actually four components that we want to look at. So I'll ex explain what it looks like in the real world or in the physical world that we live in and what it looks like in the blockchain economy. So how do we get them together? It's going to be some math later, but don't worry, it's going to be, I'm going to explain them to you. So the first part is consumption. Consumption is buying and selling goods. So haircuts, car purchases, groceries, whatever kind of repairs that you want, anything that you just spend in the economy. There's just regular consumption consumption in this current period. So things in the blockchain economy, if you talk about, say, games, you have utility, expenditure, cosmetics, you have, you have breeding of assets, say, XE, for example, maintenance, upgrades, temporary buffs, all these assets that, that allows people to, to interact and consume in the current period. And usually this is between a, a user and a smart contract, a smart contract that does that facilitates some form of execution. So that's consumption. The second thing is investment. Investment is to invest in the long-term future. The economy that we talk about is not just about the current period. It's about long-term value creation. And to create value in the long term, sometimes you have to put your assets in the long run. So this could be equipment for the firms. This could be 
homes for household, financial assets, inventory for businesses, getting a factory machine to be building whatever stuff you need to build. So that's investment. In a blockchain economy, this would be like staking protocols, this would be high value NFTs, this could be assets that accrues value over time. And so there are very similar stuff that we have in the blockchain economy that we have in the real economy. The third thing is government expenditure. So government expenditure, this will be in the, in the physical world, this will be military equipment, road repairs, bridges, fiscal policies, investment in building new bridges, in repairing the road, and earning taxes. So this is how the government comes into the space. Sure, in the crypto space, we don't have government per se, but we do have a different component of the developers or the DAOs coming together to make certain kind of upgrades to build new bridges, to build new tools, or even just operational costs, like salary of employees, maintenance costs of the server and equipment. So the government in the crypto space are basically your core developers, your devs. And lastly, net export. Net export is really import and export, and you just net them out. So export will be value coming, export is value coming into the economy, and import is value going out of the economy. And the same way in crypto space, you have the new, so when we, when we export in the crypto space, the new agents convert their external currencies to the local currencies and vice versa. So this is how we also get to calculate interoperability. Because one of the, the things that we fail to, to calculate in market cap TV on FDB is the value of interoperability. If there are more assets coming in or there are more assets being used in other ecosystems, how do we calculate the value generated by these assets, native assets from our ecosystem? that is attributed to another ecosystem. So there are a lot of components that we think about in economics. It's not just prices go up only, or how, what's the vesting share you like, or what's the total circulating supply, but all these components that make up the economy. We take this down, distill them into parameters in our calculation, and then we calculate them. So let's talk a little bit more about calculating them. And this is where we can go a little bit deeper. So here, we have two kinds of goods in this space. We have perpetual goods and expendable goods. Expendable goods are goods that are used in this current period. And if you talk about consumption just now, we talk about this current period, this is what we're talking about. And perpetual goods are goods that last for a longer term. It could be earning value in the future, you could sell them for a different price, that could be, you, know, you could use them for breeding, they can generate value in the long run. So they have these two different goods. And it's important to, to look at what, it's important to divide them into two subset of goods because they add into the calculations differently. So this, this is also quite interesting to understand that not all goods are equal in the system, not all assets are equal in the system. They add value differently in different components and parameters that we talk about. So we have consumption, which is our C, C factor. And consumption is basically the, all the prices of expendable goods times the quantity of expendable goods. So it's basically all the expendable, good, expendable goods in this period. We have uh, the earnings, Y, and Y is basically consumption plus savings added up together, and so that's that's how much income that they make. It's important to understand income because this is how we calculate GDP in traditional economics anyway. And then we can see how much savings that they have. So we know how much income they earn, we know how much they're going to consume, we know how much savings that they have. Why is savings important? Because savings will then lead to investment in the long run. Okay, so that sounds like a, there's a lot of words. Let me just distill them down to make it a lot easier to understand. So consumption is basically how much you spend for stock. How much you spend for this trip in Istanbul is your consumption. Y is your income. So how much money you brought into, into Istanbul in the first place. And S is your savings, so the total amount, let's say you brought uh, $1,000, and then you spend $800, you have $200 left, that's your savings. That's it. That's everything. All this compl complicated stuff boils down to how much you can start it with, how much you spend, how much you save. Now, diving deeper into how we're going to build this, how the whole GDP comes about. But for starters, GDP is a very complex topic. Even today, in traditional economics, people are, are arguing about GDP all the time. It's not calculated properly, there are a lot of biases in there, so it's a big, big topic. So the way to get things started in crypto is removing the interoperability part. So what do I mean by that? We focus on the closed economy. We don't talk about import-export first. We talk about a closed economy where we have the consumption part, where people are spending, we have the investment part where people are investing in the long run, and the government spending, which is all the DAOs and all the grants and initiatives to increase value in the long run. The reason we talk about this first is because if you do not have a, a running economy, nobody's going to import and export your assets. Nobody's going to demand your assets in another ecosystem. 
So it's important to have a robust economy that works in the first place, and then we can talk about an open economy after. So let's get started with a closed economy. So closed economy, there are, there are two ways that people can make money. And all these complicated stuff is really just divided into just two components. So the first one, let's say games, for example, because games is just a lot easier than the whole economy. So the first part is just how much they earn in playing the game. And the second part is how much they earn by selling their assets. Very simple. So the two stuff. It could be going to a battle, or you, it's a first person shoot the game, you play the game, and you got 50 tokens. That's how much you earn. And then you, you win this gun, and then you sell this gun, and you earn 10 tokens. So total, you have 60 tokens. That's it. So understanding consumption here is understanding, uh, understanding income here is to understand how much you earn by playing the game, and how much you sell, or how much you earn by selling any assets that you have. From earnings, we're going to understand how much the, the savings are, is going to be. So from, for savings, we want to understand it's basically everything that they earn minus the cost of, of purchasing something. So let's say, they, again, they, they earn money because they won in this first person shooter battle, they earn 50 tokens, and then they, they won this gun, and they sold the gun, and they earn 10 tokens, so they have 20 tokens in total. But they have a cost of, they need to pay 5 tokens to enter into this tournament. And they have to spend 1 token as a minting fee to mint this gun. So the total savings is basically the whatever they earn minus the cost to spend, and that's the savings. 